Nice hand, Danny. Anyone have a fly? You ready? Yeah. Right, with me is Steve Albini, guitarist and vocalist yeah, with Rakeman, who are currently in a lot of the headlines and papers, etc. Steve, what do you think of headlines that like you've received in today's evening? Um, well, specifically, this one is pretty stupid. It, it sort of fits the cliché image that Americans have of uh, the imbecilic British press. Um, it's a the story and the headline are about about what you would expect a sort of hack tabloid to, to write. I mean, it doesn't have any substance, doesn't have any basis in reality, but it's pretty. Uh, it, it uses eye-catching words and it's uh, sensationalistic, and it'll probably sell them some papers. Do you get press like this in the states? No, really, there is no attention for bands like us in the U.S., so there's no, I mean, there's no national music press like there is here, and the local newspapers generally have much better things to worry about. Yeah, we've always heard in the press about, you know, like Jello Biafra's court case, things like that, um, the sensationalism over there with the moral majority and stuff like that. Is it, is it not like we're led to believe them? Well, the moral majority is pretty impotent, really, in the U.S. That as a political force, they, they don't really exist anymore. Um, the moral majority didn't actually have a lot to do with Jello Biafra's court case. That, that had to do with uh, a, a rabid attorney in uh, California. The, the, specifically, the court case that Jello Biafra was involved in involved uh, the use of a work of art in an album jacket that was perceived as pornographic. Uh, and it was obvious to anyone who paid attention to you know, jurisprudence that, that or judicial history that he was going to get off from the, from the beginning. Um, I think it was kind of grandstanding on his part that he made such a big deal out of it. Yeah. Um, and the publicity that it that it caused uh, made his band Dead Kennedy's uh, album sales skyrocket, made him in demand as a lecturer, and uh, gave him a, a cause which allowed him to set up an organization that collected money from people who were donating around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why did you pick the name of Rateman? Uh, well, Rateman is the name of a Japanese comic book that we all like, and it's also, it's the name of the lead, main character of the comic book, who uh, is a, a guy whose job is raping people. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know the context of it from the book, uh, because it's all in Japanese, mainly. Um, but as near as anybody can tell, there is some moral correctness to his raping the people that he rapes. I don't, I don't, I don't really see how that could be, but that's the way it seems to be presented in the book. It's also he he sees it as a duty. I mean, there's a lot of passages in the book where he goes through these periods of self-doubt and agonizing guilt and that sort of stuff, but he still goes through and does his job. It's a, it's a really bizarre perspective, which we don't understand, and that's why. What's intrigued you so much about it? Though? Well all the stuff that I've just been telling yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make much sense to us. Yeah. Do you think, now, that, do you think that because you didn't, uh, you couldn't read the, you know, yeah. the text that was in Japanese, do you think then it's, uh, you're not fully justified in um, taking on the name? Well, I think, I think it, when we get it translated and uh, we're going to Japan in the spring and w while we're there, we're probably going to have somebody, you know, translate parts of Rape Man for us, although, I have this sort of sneaking fear that it's going to turn out to be very mundane, and then the, the whole mystique of it will dissolve, and it'll just, you know, we'll just be stuck with the name then. But, yeah. but for the time being, that you know, and even for the foreseeable future, we like the name, and we're going to keep it. Yeah. Do you think if all the mystique is taken out of it, uh, the, the name will uh, not be as important to you anymore? Well, I can't really say that it is important to us in the first place. It's just the the and important enough to be sticking by. Well, no, that's like that's like saying if I demanded that you change your shirt, you know, y you would you would be attaching some significance to not changing your shirt. I mean, that's not really the case. It's just it's a stupid thing for one person to expect another person to do. You know, I don't think it's. I don't think it's our place to have to defend uh, the name of the band. I, th I think it's pretty inconsequential. And so I'm disinclined to get into so many you know, friggin' arguments about it because it, it, it doesn't really seem like it's that big of a deal to us. If we, if we, and another uh, you know, a point that's been made more than once is that if we had called ourselves the rabid murderers, no one would be objecting. It's just that rape is politically a touchy issue now. And, and 
you know, if you, if you can't recognize that that is that, that's temporary and that that'll, you know, that that the political climate will change and rape will no longer be such a touchy issue, then you know you're not paying too close attention to the political process. Do you think the name will hamper your success? It already has, um, to the extent that people in the record company refuse to work on the record. Uh, right now, the record company employs, you know, a hundred people, and all but two of them uh, have completely and adamantly refused to have anything whatsoever to do with the band. You know, they won't sell the records, they won't work on the album jackets, they won't put ads together, they won't talk to the press for us, or when they do talk to the press, they, they tell the press how much they hate the name and how stupid they think we're being. Have you thought about changing the name for those reasons, then, or are you going to stick by it? No, that's the, those would be stupid reasons to change your, the band name. The only reason we would change the band name is if we didn't like it, yeah. and we like it. Right. Now, to change the subject totally, a fan outside before asked me to ask you why you've got a small dick and no contact lenses. Um, there are these two losers who've been following us around for the tour. Don't have anything better to do with their time than chase us around and come to all of our gigs, and they constantly make song requests to be dedicated to people with contact lenses and small penises. I don't know why this is such a fetish with them, but it is. I myself don't have contact lenses. I just lost my glasses the other night in Scotland. Right. Now, um, we've heard the name Bud Dwyer in the interviews in the music press over here. Why, why do you particularly like that guy? Well, I sort of, I sort of respect his determination in that uh, he blew his brains out at a news conference where uh, he was it was a news conference being held after his conviction for uh, bribery. He was a politician in the U.S. And uh, he read a little statement exonerating himself, and then he blew his brains out with a, a large handgun. And I respect the efficiency. You know, he used a large gun. Um, I respect the sort of up-the-nose attitude that made him spray his brains over the very people that had been confronting him about this stuff. And I respect the determination that it takes to blow your brains out. I mean, I, I certainly don't have that much guts. Um, can you tell us about your, your home life? You live in a punk rock dungeon. Can you talk about that? Well, actually, I don't. I, I, I've worked pretty hard not to have a grubby punk rock dungeon, but um, I just I have a, a small house. I live there with a roommate and a cat. And occasionally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bands that come through town and stay at my house. Yeah. And You've got an association with the Butthole all Surface as well. They're on the same label that we are, and I, I used to consider them friends of mine. They've, I think I've fallen out of favor with them because I've ceased kissing their ass, their collective ass, yeah. and their individual asses. You've got a collection of can openers and comedy coffee, coffee cups as well. No, those, there's a... The previous owner of my house, whose name was also Bud, uh, had a collection of comedy coffee cups and, and can openers and a bunch of other weird things. Yeah. Th those are just some of the things that he left in the house that sort of remind me of him and his sad little life. Yeah. Can you tell us about Super Pussy? Super Pussy is an imaginary comic book character uh, that we came up with to sort of personify uh, a very aggressive uh, female power. Most of the, the really potent superhero images in comic books and TV and stuff are, you know, men with weird weapons and magic powers and stuff like that. And we thought it would be thought it would be equally interesting if there was sort of a, you know, an ass-kicking, cannibal, man-hating, lesbian, you know, drug-taking, psychopathic motorcycle chick that had, you know, the same sort of respect and the same sort of, uh, I don't know, criminological importance, you know. You produced a lot of bands, um, including the Pixies, since the demise of Big Black. Um, how long did it take you to put together Late Night? You, you asked me about production. You didn't ask me about production, <coughs> yeah. but you want to know how long it took to get, put together Rape Man. Okay. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't really understand the yeah. question. Then. I didn't either. So. Okay. Um, well, Rape Man formed in theory before Big Black broke up, even uh, because when Ray, the drummer, uh, had found out that Big Black was breaking up, he called me and said, "Well, when Big Black breaks up, I'd like to come up and try putting a band together." And it seemed like a really good idea. So. How long was it before you actually broke up? That you, you know, that you knew it was going to happen. Uh, about nine months before Big Black broke up, Santiago said he was going to leave to go to law school, and from that afternoon forward, we realized that, that was the end of the band. I think it was a good thing that uh, 
the, the lifespan of the band was there for uh, yeah, limited. Finite, yeah. And that was, I, I think we definitely, at least from the creative end, we definitely packed everything in that we could. And I think if, if we had had an indeterminate future, we probably would have been lazier about it. And I, efficiency is one of the things that I admire. So what happened to uh, Scratch Acid? They just broke up all together? All yeah, um, they just, for the same reasons that most bands break up, they got tired of each other, decided they were through and broke up. The bass player and the drummer, did they move to Chicago to where you were? Yeah. What, what happened to the uh, title of the, the album? I mean, it was, there was two mules. Two and nuns and a pack. Yeah. And ZZ Top's first album, and you've chosen not to use any of those. Sort of general question. Um, what are your specific aims with Rayman? Well, we don't really have any goals. It's not like there are things that we want to do that once we've done them we'll be satisfied. Um, we sort of have a methodology that we want to pursue. As a band, we write songs all at the same time, as opposed to anybody writing a song and bringing it to the band finished. We sort of write everything simultaneously, and that's working out nicely. Nicely, actually. There's a, a fellow, a guy in Minneapolis, uh, this is a comp intricate, intricate story, but there's a house in Minneapolis that's full up to the sea, up to within about three feet of the ceiling with garbage. Um, a, fam a guy had lived there with his wife and three children, two of whom were twin deaf girls. The other one was a teenage boy. He'd lived there for about eight years, and in those eight years, had never taken the garbage out. It just the garbage had just piled up in the house in plastic bags, loose, you know. And of him, there was a picture of him in a newspaper where he was sort of showing his living room and he, he was crouched like this, standing on this heap of garbage with his back pressed against the ceiling of his living room because it was just garbage from floor to within a couple, three feet of the ceiling. And just that image of a guy whose house was so full of garbage that he had to stoop over just to stand in his own living room kind of appealed to me. Where did these ideas come from? Is it something you read in the paper and stuff like that? Sometimes, sometimes people you meet things you hear people talk about. What do you want to do when, you know, you finished your musical sort of career? I don't know. I don't have any, I don't have any uh, desire to finish that yet.